on the Aristotelian ethics that many scholars suppose Aquinas accepts, a moral virtue is a habit which is acquired through practice and which disposes the will to act in accordance with reason. Given this strong connection between virtue and reason, some scholars see the passions in Aristotelian thought as at best ancillary to moral virtue and at worst an obstacle to it. Whatever the truth of this view may be as regards Aristotle's own ethics, it is certainly false in its central claims as regards the ethics of Aquinas. Aquinas recognizes those acquired Aristotelian virtues, but he thinks that they're not real virtues. In fact, Aquinas goes so far as to maintain that the passions, or the suitably formulated intellectual and volitional analogs to the passions, are not only the foundation of any real ethical life, but also the flowering of what's best in it. For Aquinas, there can be no moral virtue at all without love. So, for example, Aquinas says, and the quotations on your handout, I won't clue you to the handout, I'll just expect you can use it to help you make your way through. Aquinas says, it is written, he who does not love abides in death, now the spiritual life is perfected by the virtues, since it is by them that we live rightly, as Augustine states. Therefore, the virtues cannot be without love. Now on Aquinas' views of the passions, love can be understood as a passion in an extended sense. In this sense, a passion is in the intellective appetite, or will. And love, in this sense, on Aquinas' view, is essential to all real moral virtue. Without love, no real virtue at all is possible. In this lecture today, I want to show what difference it makes to difficult ethical issues if we take love as foundational to ethics in this way. In particular, I want to show what Aquinas' account of love implies for issues of guilt, forgiveness, and reconciliation. We can begin with a brief overview of Aquinas' account of love. For Aquinas, love requires two interconnected desires, the desire for the good of the beloved and the desire for union with the beloved. Aquinas recognizes different kinds and degrees of love between persons. For example, he thinks it's possible to desire the good for humanity in general and also to desire some sort of union with all humanity, say in the shared beatific vision in heaven, for example. And so on Aquinas' account, a person can have an impartial love of all human beings. But Aquinas also supposes that some loves are and ought to be greater than others. A person ought to love all human beings, but not equally. She should love some persons more than others in virtue of having certain relationships with them which ought to make her love for them greater than her love for humanity in general. Certain things are also worth noting with regard to the desires of love. To begin with the desire for union, whatever exactly the union is which is desired in love on Aquinas' account, the desire for union is not equivalent to the desire to be in the company of the beloved. Other philosophers have remarked that one can love a person without desiring to be in that person's company, and being in someone's company is obviously not equivalent to being united to her. It is manifestly possible to be in the company of someone when one is alienated from her rather than united to her. So desiring union with a person might not include a desire to be in that person's company, at least not now, as that person currently is. With regard to the desire for the good of the beloved, the goodness in question is not to be identified with moral goodness only. It's goodness in the broader sense that encompasses beauty, elegance or efficiency, and metaphysical as well as moral goodness. Furthermore, because Aquinas holds that there is an objective standard of goodness, the measure of value for the goodness at issue in love is also objective. Given Aquinas' ethical views, then, the good of the beloved has to be understood as that which truly is in the interest of the beloved and which truly does conduce to the beloved's flourishing. <clears throat> 
With this very brief summary of Aquinas' account of love, it should be clear that it has implications as regards forgiveness. That's because whatever exactly is required for forgiveness, it must involve some species of love for the person in need of forgiveness. A person who refuses to forgive someone who's hurt her or been unjust to her is not loving towards the offender. And a person who does forgive someone who has treated her badly also manifests love of one degree or another towards him. So whatever else a person's forgiveness is, it seems to include a kind of love of someone who's harmed her or committed an injustice against her. Since love emerges from the interaction of two desires, for the good of the beloved and for union with the beloved, the absence of either desire, either desire, is sufficient to undermine love. To the extent to which love is implicated in forgiveness, the absence of either desire undermines forgiveness too. So failure to forgive can find expression not only in resentment or vengefulness, but also in a rejection of the desire for union with the wrongdoer. On Aquinas' account of love, a person, Paula, forgives another person, Jerome, only if she desires the good for Jerome and union with Jerome, even in the face of his bad treatment of her. If Paula lacks either desire of love where Jerome is concerned, she does not forgive him. It's important to see that on Aquinas' account of love, it's possible for Paula to forgive Jerome unilaterally, without even repentance on Jerome's part. Because it's up to Paula alone whether she desires the good for Jerome and desires union with him. On the other hand, however, the way in which the desires of love are fulfilled, or whether they are fulfilled at all, will depend crucially on the condition of the wrongdoer being forgiven. When in forgiveness, Paul forms the two desires of love for Jerome, the nature of the appropriate fulfillment of those desires has to be a function of Jerome's state. Whether Paula can and should have any continued companionship of any kind with Jerome, and the character and extent of such company depends on Jerome's state. If Jerome poses a serious threat to Paula's having what is good for her, then Paula's staying with Jerome, or otherwise allowing Jerome to harm her, enables Jerome to violate the desires of love for her. But his failure at loving her is not good for Jerome. So Paula is not loving Jerome and letting him harm her or treat her unjustly. Rather, she's violating the desires of love with regard to Jerome in being an enabler of his wrongdoing against her. For Aquinas, then, a person can forgive unilaterally as she can love unrequitedly. But the desires of love and forgiveness, like the desires of love generally, are inefficacious by themselves to bring about what they desire. A person who forgives, like a person who loves, has to be responsive to the person who's the object of her desires. And so she cannot have what she wants in love or forgiveness just by wanting it. Paula's desire for the good for Jerome can't be fulfilled if, in self-destructive impulses, Jerome refuses the good being offered him. And Paula's desire for union with Jerome cannot result in any kind of union with him as long as his state of character and current condition keep her from being close to him. Finally, as I explained at the outset here, on Aquinas' account, love is obligatory in the sense that for any person, the absence of love is morally blameworthy and the presence of love is necessary for moral good or excellence. Given the connection between love and forgiveness, it follows that forgiveness is also obligatory in the same way and to the same extent. It does not follow that any given wrongdoer, Jerome, has a right to forgiveness from any person, Paula, whom he's hurt. On Aquinas' account, as also on many contemporary accounts, rights and obligations are not correlative 
Paula can have an obligation with regard to Jerome, even if Jerome does not have a correlative right with regard to Paula. So even though Jerome has no right to Paula's forgiveness, on Aquinas' views, Paula would be subject to appropriate moral censure if she refused to forgive Jerome. In refusing to forgive him, Paula would be unloving towards him. And in being unloving, Paula would be worthy of moral disapprobation. On this account of forgiveness, then, it's a mistake to suppose that repentance and making amends are necessary for forgiveness. Nothing on the part of the wrongdoer is necessary for forgiveness of him. With this summary of Aquinas' account of love and the correlative account of forgiveness, we can now turn to a complicated case involving guilt. It is often thought that the remedy for guilt is forgiveness, and that repentance and the making of amends on the part of a wrongdoer are both necessary and sufficient for forgiveness. The making of amends is generally considered to have two parts, namely reasonable reparation of any damage done, and then also something extra, some penance, that compensates for the injustice in the wrongdoing. So on this common view, a wronged person should not forgive a wrongdoer without his repenting and making amends. But if he has repented and made amends, then the wrong person is unreasonable if she refuses to forgive him. And if she does forgive him, then the wrongdoer is relieved of his guilt. And since his guilt is removed, nothing stands in the way of her reconciliation with him and his restoration to his usual place in the human community. That's a common, not to say standard, account now. But here comes the complicated case I want to raise. Consider Simon Wiesenthal's book, The Sunflower, on the possibility and limits of forgiveness. In that book, Wiesenthal tells a story, a true story. It's a story of a German soldier dying in terrible conditions, knowing he was dying very soon, matter of hours, matter of a couple of days. It's a story of a German soldier who was guilty of horrendous evil against Jewish men, women, and children. And I won't tell you what he did because it's really horrible and you don't want it in your mind and I don't want it on the videotape. But this dying German soldier desperately wanted forgiveness before he died and he wanted the forgiveness from a Jew. He wanted forgiveness from one Jew and reconciliation with that Jew before he died. Wiesenthal was then a prisoner in a Nazi concentration camp and in terrible condition, abused, beaten, starved, cold, hungry, thirsty, and waiting for death at any moment. But he was brought from the camp as a representative Jew to hear the German soldier's story and the soldier's pleas for forgiveness. Now in the story as Wiesenthal presents it, it seems that the German soldier was completely, heartbrokenly, genuinely repentant. Because he was dying, there was little that the soldier could do to make amends. But his broken heartedness over his evil and his self-excoriating confession of what he had done, that was as much reparation and penance as was possible for him then. In those circumstances, in remarkably admirable ways, Wiesenthal dealt humanely with the soldier, gave him water, brushed flies away from him. But when the soldier's confession was finally complete, Wiesenthal got up and left him without a single word. As Wiesenthal understands his own reaction to that soldier, he did not grant the dying man the forgiveness he longed for. In The Sunflower, Wiesenthal tells this story, and then he presents reflections on the story by numerous thinkers, many of them noted scholars or eminent religious authorities in different traditions. Wiesenthal invites these thinkers to consider whether they would have forgiven that soldier. And here's the interesting point. 
their responses are noteworthy for the highly divergent intuitions they express and the equal amount of fervor and passion with which they express them. A number of respondents claim with conviction that the repentant dying soldier should be forgiven. So, for example, the influential former president of Notre Dame, a Catholic priest, Father Theodore Hesburgh, he says this, he says, my whole instinct is to forgive. Of course, the sin here is monumental. It's still finite, and God's mercy is infinite. If asked to forgive by anyone for anything, I would forgive because God would forgive. But other equally thoughtful and equally eminent respondents report that they share Wiesenthal's reaction. In their view, the soldier's evil was great enough to destroy forever his chance at forgiveness. As they see it, by his monstrous acts, the soldier cut himself off permanently from reconciliation with other human beings and from any restoration into ordinary human society. And in their view, this evaluation of that soldier would not be altered even if he had lived to do some severe penance, even if it were possible for there to be reparation and penance for the unspeakable harm he had done. For these respondents, the soldier should not be forgiven. On their view, there is no way that soldier's guilt can be removed. There's no way the soldier can be restored to any acceptable place within the human community. As they see it, it is not the case that repentance, reparation, and penance are sufficient for forgiveness, or that these things together with forgiveness are sufficient to remove guilt. Reconciliation may be denied and guilt may remain even where there is repentance with whatever reparation and penance is possible. So here's what I want to say, commenting on these reflections in this story. In my view, Aquinas' account of love and the account of forgiveness that it implies helps us to see how to adjudicate these passionate and contradictory intuitions. To begin with, we should see, should easily see, that on Aquinas' account, forgiveness of the German soldier in the story is obligatory. And it would still be obligatory on Aquinas' account, even if the soldier hadn't repented. It does not follow, however, that Wiesenthal's behavior with respect to the soldier should have been otherwise. In the first place, it helps to see that contrary to Wiesenthal's own self-evaluation, nothing about Wiesenthal's behavior implies that Wiesenthal failed to forgive the soldier. On the Thomistic account, forgiveness is a matter of desiring what is good, really objectively good for a wrongdoer, and desiring union with the wrongdoer, not in the sense of joining him, but in the sense of being at one with him. These desires, are what is morally obligatory and not their fulfillment. And nothing in Wiesenthal's story about his behavior toward the soldier indicate that Wiesenthal lacked those desires. On the contrary, the dealings, the details of Wiesenthal's dealing with the soldier, those details suggest a humanity and a compassion for the dying man grounded in such desires. Nonetheless, as I'm gonna to try to show in what follows, even if it were true, contrary to Wiesenthal's own self-assessment, that he did forgive the soldier, nothing about that assessment implies that Wiesenthal should have said anything to the soldier to give the soldier what the man so badly wanted, a sense of restoration to ordinary human society. Nor does this account of forgiveness imply that Wiesenthal should have been willing to be reconciled with the soldier. As I'm going to try to show, in cases of grave evil, forgiveness, even with the wrongdoer's repentance and making amends, that may not be sufficient for the removal of guilt or for the moral permissibility of reconciliation. Silently leaving the soldier may have been all that was morally permissible for Wiesenthal to do, as many of the respondents in the Sunflower Book so fervently maintain. <clears throat> 
So on the Thomistic account of love and forgiveness, which I support, those respondents in the sunflower convinced that forgiveness should be denied the, den the dying German soldier, those folks are mistaken. Nonetheless, I'm also going to argue in support of their vehement rejection of any kind of reconciliation with the German soldier. I'm going to try to show that in some cases of grave evil, repentance and amends are insufficient for the removal of guilt, and if guilt is not removed, then reconciliation may be morally impermissible, even if forgiveness is obligatory. In other words, it follows on the count I'm going to defend, that forgiveness and reconciliation can come apart. One reason for this fact is that unlike forgiveness, reconciliation and the removal of guilt can't be unilateral and unconditional. For the removal of guilt and reconciliation with the wrongdoer, something is required from the wrongdoer. And if the wrongdoer cannot or does not give what is needed to remove his guilt, then reconciliation may be morally unavailable. And so guilt may remain even after forgiveness is granted. To see this point, it helps to begin by being clear about guilt. So what is guilt? And what <laughs> problems does it produce for the wrongdoer? I think it helps to have before us a particular case of really serious wrongdoing and also exemplary repentance and reparation. So consider the case of John Newton, who was an 18th century slave trader, but who finished life as a successful proponent of abolition of the slave trade. When Newton was still a young man, on three different occasions, he was the captain of a slave ship. And on those three ships alone, he was responsible for transporting many Africans. The conditions on the ships were unspeakable. A large percentage of the Africans transported died during the voyage. Their suffering was heartbreaking, but the suffering of those who survived was worse. They were sold into harsh slavery, and their children were born into it. A lengthy religious conversion changed Newton's life dramatically. Somewhere in the course of this conversion, Newton became horrified at what he had done in the slave trade. He became stricken at the suffering he had helped to bring about. In his fervent repentance, Newton worked hard in formal and informal ways to help bring about the abolition of the slave trade in England. Among other things, he wrote a pamphlet called Thoughts Upon the Slave Trade, in which he presented in great detail, in great detail, to public view, the horrible suffering he had visited on the Africans on his ships. And he spared himself no humiliation in revealing what he had done. On the contrary, he held himself up to public shock and revulsion for his actions as a slave trader. Newton's pamphlet was very widely read, and it made a great difference to the debate over abolition. Newton lived long enough to see his efforts victorious. The Slave Trade Act, which abolished the slave trade in England, was passed in 1807, and Newton died shortly after it passed. Newton's efforts at helping to end the slave trade were his reparation and his penance for his evil. In his efforts for abolition and his public excoriation of himself in that pamphlet, Newton did what he could to make reparation and to do penance for the evil he had done. So that's his story, and now think about his guilt. When Newton was in his slave trading years, one problem for him lay in defective states of his psyche. In that period of his life, Newton thought that slave trading was morally acceptable. That's a big defect in a psyche. He thought it was morally acceptable, and he wanted to engage in it. That's a big defect in the will. So the first problem for a guilty person lies in himself, in his morally wrong states of intellect and will, and the corrupt habits from which they stem or to which they contribute. Furthermore, those defects of intellect and will don't exhaust the problem in Newton, however important they are. 
There are also other psychic defects, more subtle but not less damaging to Newton. For example, there's memory. The very memory of having engaged in a great evil that caused cruel suffering to others diminishes something morally good in the wrongdoer's psyche too. By staying in memory, the evil a person such as Newton did remains part of Newton's present. His remembering his slave trading isn't itself an evil act, but there is something morally lamentable about the continued presence of his evil acts in his memory nonetheless. That may be one reason why people who have done monstrous <coughs> evil find their memories an affliction. And then there are the empathic capacities. Most people cannot simulate the mind of a person who commits a morally horrific act. And we give expression to that incapacity by saying sincerely, I can't imagine how a person could do something like that. But the perpetrator himself does understand what it feels like to do an act of that sort. And what is worse, he understands what it feels like to want to do an evil of that sort. The hard barrier the I can't that ordinarily decent people have in their psyches against grotesque evil is missing in the perpetrators of great evil, and the elasticity or flabbiness of psyche consequent on such evil, that can remain even if the wrongdoer repents. Because they are not moral defects in the will, these psychological relics of moral wrongdoing in memory and the empathic capacities aren't by themselves culpable or worthy of punishment, but there is something morally regrettable about them all the same. So defects of psyche and intellect, will, memory, and the empathic capacities are the first problem for a person guilty of serious wrongdoing. And the second problem, of course, lies in the world, in the effects of the wrongs done. The suffering of the human beings Newton cap kidnapped and enslaved that suffering was horrible, and he was responsible for it. Just restoring Newton's intellect and will to the state and condition of a morally good person through repentance, for example, leaves unaddressed the suffering he caused. And even if there are no particular victims for a person's wrongdoing, as when someone simply wastes inherited great wealth and trivial pursuits and fails to contribute to society as he might have done, there remains for him the problem that the world is worse than it might have been because of what he did or failed to do. So those are the first two problems of guilt in the psyche of the wrongdoer and in the world. And the consequence of these problems of guilt, the consequence has the further effect of altering the wrongdoer's relations with others in his society, or as in the case of the German soldier, with the whole human community. The state of the wrongdoer's psyche and the facts about the damage and injustice he has done can leave others angry at him, alienated from him. The victims of his wrongdoing may resent him or even hate him, and others who learn about his wrongdoing may share those attitudes, even if they were not themselves harmed by his wrongdoing. They also might hate him or turn away from him as someone with whom they refuse to associate because of what he is and what he has done. So those are the major problems of guilt in the psyche, in the world, and in relations with others. And now we can think about the role of repentance, reparation, and penance in the removal of such guilt. It's clear that repentance alone can remove some of the defects introduced into the wrongdoer by his morally wrong actions. So for example, after his repentance, Newton lost the morally wrong states of intellect and will he had during his slave trading years, and he replaced them with the morally decent states of intellect and will that anyone might have had as regards slave trading. And we might also suppose that his repentance was fervent enough so that even his dispositions were altered for the better. Through repentance then, with respect to slave trading, Newton's intellect and will became like those of the abolitionists in his society. Now, at least in cases of grave moral wrongdoing, repentance alone can't repair the damage the wrongdoer did or restore the wrongdoer to the place and community he had before his wrongdoing. But reparation and penance are typically supposed to help in this connection. 
I'm going to refer to reparation and penance together as making amends or as satisfaction. The word satisfaction, the English word satisfaction, comes from the Latin term satisfacere, and the etymology of the Latin terms comes from satis, enough, plus facere, to do. To make satisfaction by reparation and by penance is to do enough by doing what one can, and by this means to make amends. After his conversion, Newton joined forces with the English abolitionist William Wilberforce and others to alter public opinion about the slave trade. By the time Newton died, he was not only friends with these abolitionists, he was in fact held in honor by them, and it's not hard to see why. In Newton's passionate efforts on behalf of the abolition of the slave trade, he tried to make reparation for what he had done as a slave trader, and his pamphlet, which made public revelation of those actions of his of which he was most ashamed, that pamphlet was his penance. And together, those things constituted Newton's satisfaction. His satisfaction was successful in making him a different man from the man he had been, even from the man he was when he first repented. His repentance for his slave trading healed the psychic defects in his intellect and will, and his work of satisfaction tried to undo the damage and injustice for which he had been responsible. And so it also altered his relationship with others. When Wilberforce was friends with Newton at the time the Slave Trade Act passed, Wilberforce was friends not just with a repentant slave trader, Wilberforce was friends with a powerful enemy of the slave trade. So in giving himself to the cause of the abolition of the slave trade, a repentant Newton did all that he could, and by doing so, did enough to make up for the evil of his slave trading. Consequently, repentance and satisfaction have a useful purpose. They alter both the wrongdoer and the things in the world damaged by his wrongdoing. And certainly Newton is commendable for the way in which he made satisfaction. But what I wanna say is that contrary to what these reflections might lead you to suppose, repentance and satisfaction on the part of a person such as Newton are not sufficient to remedy the whole problem of guilt. That's because none of these things is sufficient to change the past, to make it not the case that Newton did the damage and injustice that he did. Consider to begin with Newton's relations with others harmed by him or alienated from him in his slave trading year. Newton's repentance and satisfaction aren't sufficient to restore those relationships of Newton's to the condition they had or would have had before his wrongdoing. Someone might object here that the relationship between a wrongdoer and those wronged by him should be healed even by the wrongdoer's repentance and satisfaction. When the wrongdoer repents, then he gains the beliefs and desires of a morally decent person. And so someone might suppose others should adopt towards the wrongdoer the same attitudes they would have had towards him before his bad acts. That is, the same attitudes they would take toward any morally decent person. But this objection rests on the mistaken assumption that a relationship is not affected by the past state of the persons in it that only their present condition is relevant to the relationship. In fact, for Newton and those who were wronged by Newton or who knew his history, Newton's past lives into the present through everyone's memory. Newton himself wrote about his slave trading past this. He said, I hope it will always be a subject of humiliating reflection to me that I was once an active instrument in a business at which my heart now shudders. And no doubt, Newton did well to shudder at what he had done on the sea in the slave ships. But if it is always a subject of shuddering for Newton, then it's hard to see that his repentance and satisfaction are sufficient to undo all the morally lamentable effects on his own psyche brought about by his slave trading. Something that would have been wholesome and healthy in Newton is diminished and is replaced by shuddering in virtue of this memory of his past acts. Furthermore, it is hard not to share Newton's view that he must never forget these acts. 
there would be something terrible about his forgetting the evil of his participation in the slave trade. In fact, it's not unreasonable to suppose there's a duty to remember wrongdoing if the wrongdoing is serious enough. So Newton's repentance and satisfaction may heal his intellect and will, but they can't erase the past evil from his memory, and they can't remove the correlative elasticity from his empathic capacities either. If Newton's repentance and satisfaction aren't enough to remove the problems for, of guilt for Newton in his psyche, are they nonetheless sufficient to remove his guilt as regards to the damage and injustice he did? Satisfaction is a matter of doing what one can and so doing satis, enough. And certainly Newton is exemplary in having done all he could, so that on this score it seems that he did enough and more. Consequently, it seems that in this respect, at any rate, his guilt is removed, so that his relationships with others can be restored and he can be reconciled even with his victims. But clearly, this optimistic view is not right. Clearly it is not. Satisfaction such as Newton's is enough if it's considered relative to Newton, that is, relative to what Newton could do. But there's no reason to think that it's enough relative to the victims. How could anything Newton did be enough for those who had suffered from his slave trading? How did his work of satisfaction help those who had suffered on his slave ships? How did it help the children who suffered in virtue of being born into slavery? Nothing in Newton's subsequent attempts to abolish the slave trade in England altered the terrible suffering of those who died on his ships and the even worse suffering of those who lived to be slaves. Nothing in what Newton did as satisfaction could make up to them the suffering Newton's evil caused them. Consequently, why should the victims of his wrongdoing or anybody else horrified at his actions think his repentance and satisfaction are sufficient to remove Newton's guilt or to restore Newton to the place he would have had in the human community before his slave trading? So here's what I want to say in conclusion, and don't get your hopes up, it's a long conclusion. <laughs> Here is where things stand. The Thomistic view of ethics as grounded in love and the correlative account of forgiveness provide an insightful resolution of the problem posed by Simone Wiesenthal in his book, The Sunflower. Although forgiveness, like love, is always obligatory, even forgiveness of unrepentant wrongdoers, reconciliation does not follow immediately on forgiveness. For perpetrators of grave evil, even their fervent repentance and self-sacrificial satisfaction may not be enough for reconciliation. It can be obligatory to forgive and nonetheless not morally permissible to be reconciled with a wrongdoer even when the wrongdoer has repented and made satisfaction. A relationship is an ongoing interaction among persons and it's dependent on the characteristics of all the persons in the relationship. If, because of his past acts, a perpetrator of evil is not now the person he was, then others affected by him or aware of his past evil cannot treat him as if he now were the person he once was. They cannot unilaterally reform the relationship they had or might have had with him when he was a different person from the person he is now in consequence of his evil. Therefore, if a person's moral wrongdoing is great enough, it can obstruct or obviate reconciliation with him, even if he's genuinely and wholeheartedly repentant. Repentance and satisfaction can make a wrongdoer a different person from the person he was when he engaged in the wrongdoing. But even such exemplary repentance and satisfaction as Newton's can't remove all the problems of guilt. So the highly divergent views of the respondents in Wiesenthal's Sunflower can all be justified. The views of those who argue in favor of the forgiveness of the dying German soldier, those views are surely right. Forgiveness of him is obligatory, just as love is. 
But those who repudiate with fervor any forgiveness of him are also right if we suppose that under the heading of forgiveness they mean the removal of guilt, reconciliation, and restoration to human community. Even a lifetime's worth of satisfaction, if the soldier had had another lifetime to complete it, coupled with heartbroken repentance on his part, those things would not have been sufficient to remove his guilt or restore him to his former place in human society. The damage and injustice he did were so great that their past effects on others and their ongoing effects on the soldiers and others who remember what he did, those things put the soldier at a distance of light years from ordinary human community. And here I want to make a theological point. Anselm's account of the atonement of Christ is based on the idea that although human beings owe a great debt because of the evil they have done, they are unable to pay that debt. On Anselm's view, that is why Christ, who is both human and divine, pays this debt for them. Because he's human, Christ is a member of the species that owes the debt, and because he's God, Christ has the resources to pay the debt. So as Anselm sees it, only Christ has the resources to make satisfaction for human wrongdoing. I confess to you that I don't like Anselm. And elsewhere, I've argued against Anselm's account of the atonement. But what the reflections of this paper show is that at least one part of Anselm's account is surely right. In consequence of grave evil, a human being may incur a debt of recompense so monumental that nothing he could do could ever repay it. Only contrary to Anselm's account, the reflections of this paper imply that the debt is owed to the victims of human evil. If there is an account of Christ's atonement on which Christ's satisfaction removes the guilt of human beings, then whatever else is contained in that account, it will have to portray Christ's work of satisfaction as satisfaction made to the victims of human evil. Only human beings owe the debt to the suffering victims of their evil. But it may be true, as Anselm thought, that only God has the resources to pay that debt. And so in this connection, I want to conclude by pointing out that on Newton's own view of the matter, the story of Newton's satisfaction, as I've told it here, is incomplete. Newton did not suppose that his own efforts at satisfaction were what had removed his guilt or enabled him to be reconciled to others, including even the victims of his slave trading. As many people know, Newton wrote the famous hymn, Amazing Grace. As that hymn expresses, Newton believed that it was the amazing grace of God that had found him, wretch that he was, and restored him. Newton's work of satisfaction manifests his great gratitude for that grace and for the satisfaction of Christ, which in Newton's view did what Newton himself could not have done to make amends for Newton's evil. Now these theological considerations are much too complicated to be dealt with briefly in passing, and I mention them only <coughs> at the end here, only for the sake of not leaving you depressed. <laughs> I mention them only to end on a more optimistic note than these preceding reflections of mine might otherwise imply. Aquinas thought that there is no wrongdoing so evil that the wrongdoer cannot afterwards be restored to an even more admirable condition in himself and in the human community than he would have had before he did the wrongdoing. But Aquinas thought so because of the implications of the account of Christ's satisfaction that Aquinas himself accepted. On that Thomistic account of Christ's atonement for human sin, it's right to see Newton as a hero in the history of the slave trade, as many people, me included, do. And on that Thomistic account, even the dying German soldier can be not only forgiven, but in fact restored in reconciliation and in community with all others. But these optimistic conclusions about the removal of guilt, even for great evil, these optimistic conclusions are grounded in the Thomistic interpretation of the theological doctrine of Christ's atonement. 
It implies that what is owed to the victims of human evil and what is needed to heal the psyche of a wrongdoer, those things are provided by the satisfaction of Christ. When Christ's atonement is added to the story of guilt and forgiveness, then it turns out that those who refuse reconciliation with the dying German soldier in Wiesenthal's story are after all wrong. Christ can make satisfaction for that soldier in such a way that the soldier's guilt is fully and finally removed. But whether this optimistic conclusion about human evil is right, or whether the more pessimistic attitude of those who refuse reconciliation with the soldier are right, that rests in the end on theological considerations. And with that, I'm done. Thank you.